Validate today's message is spiritual exercise in the new year. I've done one kind of like this several, several years ago. I think it's back in 2012, according to, to my notes, the looking back in the Wayback Machines. But, uh, you know, we're inundated, seems like this. First of all, how are you doing with last year's resolutions that you made? Few laughs. laughs. Some other people were probably smart enough not to even make any. But uh, there's nothing wrong with New Year's resolutions. But be sure that you're going to keep them for you, for you utter the word. You know, try to make sure you keep them, especially if it has to do with God. If you're going to put His name in it, you better be sure that you're going to do what you say you're going to do. Amen. But uh, it seems like this time of year we're just inundated with these uh, th this new resolutions that we need, you know, new fad things, maybe exercise equipment, which most of the time it just ends up as, as clothes racks in your bedroom, right? Before, before you know it. I know somebody's got a ton of weight equipment, and I mean one room just set aside for weights. It's got every machine you can mention inside there. All it is, it's a clothes hanger. So, <laughs> so it is. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we, we, we want to make good resolutions because we, we, we want to make our bodies in better shape, right? This is the temple of God. That's, that's good. I don't get past just the diet. Just maybe, I cut out sugar. That's about the extent that I'm going to do. I'm not going to exercise. I'm not going to lie to you and tell you I'm going to start an exercise plan because I am. I'm not going to do it. But I am going to watch what I eat and try to take care of this, this uh, temple that I've got here because it is the temple of God. But uh, most of the things that we see have to do with an exercise, a physical exercise for the new year, just to get our bodies in shape. But it's important that we need to understand, guys, and Paul, he actually, uh, Paul tells us in, in 1 Timothy 4, 8, that uh, he says this, for physical training is of some value, but godly, godliness has value for all things holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. So Paul is saying that physical exercise is good for the physical, it's, it's for right now, but it's just temporal. It's just temporal. But uh, spiritual exercise, it helps us in this life and in eternal life. So it, it helps both ways. That's what he's trying to say. So. We're going to be in Hebrews chapter uh, 12, and uh, Hebrews chapter 12, uh, verses 1 through 3, gives us about four spiritual exercises that, that we can uh, uh, maybe make some resolutions with or, or, or things of that nature for 2020. You know, I like to think of it as starting the, the third decade in, in the 21st century, if you think about it like that. But, or maybe you're just coming out of the second decade. I don't know how you count from, from 20 on, but I'm just like 20 starts a new decade, so that's the third decade. Not that that's a, it makes a deal of difference at all. has nothing to do with the message. But the first point that I want to make, is I'm going to make four points because there's four uh, exercises, spiritual exercises that we can use here to help us through this, this year and to grow us spiritually as we need to uh, as Christians. And that the first point I want to make is remember forerunners of faith, of our faith. Now the first word in the verse is therefore. And what do I tell you? It Anytime you back. see therefore in Scripture, you got to look and see what the therefore is therefore. Right? In this case, it, it's, it happens to be talking about the, uh, the, the heroes of faith. Uh, Chapter 11, Hebrews chapter 11, is known as the, the, hall, as the Hebrews Hall of Faith. Sometimes it's the Hebrews Heroes of Faith, if you will, too. But it talks about, and there's, a, I'm not going to read all of them because there's 40 verses, but uh, it talks about the, the, the four runners being those in the Old Testament, those, those people of faith who found their way in God through faith. Starting out with uh, with uh, Abel, and moving on through Abraham, and and and, uh, and and like that, and Enoch was right after him, and then it's uh, like I said, Abraham, Noah before Abraham, then Abraham, and then uh, uh, it goes on to uh, to uh, even Isaac and Joseph and and uh, Moses and 
But he, and I wrote down some of the verses that I wanted to read. 11 1 says this Now faith, now faith is being sure of what we, we hope for and certain of what we do not see. This is what the, the, the ancients were commended for. And it's meaning the, uh, those heroes of faith that I was speaking about. And in verse 6, it says, And without faith, it is, it is impossible, and without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to Him must believe that He exists and, the, and that the rewards those, and it, He rewards those who earnestly seek Him. And then I wrote down also, uh, marked out, underlined also verse 13 that says this, All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not re uh, receive the, the things promised. They only saw them and, and welcomed them from a distance. That means that they look forward to the time where Christ was going to die for our sins, that the Messiah would come. That's what that means. And then verse 27 says this. He says, By faith he left Egypt, speaking of Moses. By faith he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He, per he persevered because he saw him who was invisible. He saw the invisible God. Uh, uh, invisible to him because Christ had not come yet, but still put his faith in the Messiah, just like everybody else was doing. Is it for a time to come? I'm going to go ahead and read through some of these others because uh, uh, beginning about verse 32, and maybe I should have put all this on there, but I didn't. If you if you have your Bibles, you follow them along with me. Verse 32. And what and what more? Because he mentioned all these other people. He said, "But what more shall I say? I do not have time to to tell about Gideon, Barak, Sam, uh, Samson, uh, Jeph, Jephthah, Jephthah, uh, David, Samuel, and the prophets, who through faith." Conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained uh, what and gained what was promised. Who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the the, uh, the the fury of the flames, and escaped the the edge of the sword. Whose whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle and and uh, and routed foreign armies. Uh, women received back their their dead. Raised from the uh, raised to life again. Others were were tortured and refused to uh, to be uh, to be released so that they might gain a better resurrection. Uh, some faced jeers and floggings, while still others were chained and put in prison. They were stoned. They were sawn in half, sawn in two. Uh, they were put to death by the sword. They went about in, in, in sheepskins and, and goatskins, de uh, destitute, uh, perse persecuted, and, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in, in deserts and mountains and in caves and in holes in the ground. They were all condemned for their faith. Yet none of them received what, what had been promised. God had, had planned something better uh, for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect. And what that's referring to is what you can read in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning about 4, uh, 13, where it speaks about us being caught up in the air. Those who are uh, dead in Christ will rise first, and then those who will remain will be caught up in the air with Him. See, we all go to heaven together. Amen? We all go to heaven together. And that's what He's referring to. So when the therefore there, I just went through all of that just to tell you, just to show you what the therefore is there for. It's there to uh, to tell you about uh, the plight of those uh, those heroes of faith in the Old Testament, in chapter eleven there. So but look what it says though. Uh, therefore, since we are surrounded by such uh, such a great cloud of witnesses. That's this first part of it. I'm gonna just just uh, just go from there, and the next part I'll. Uh, the first three of these points is going to be in uh, verse 1. I've said 1a, but actually just say the first part of, of the verse. It says, therefore, and that's talking about chapter 11, but chapter 12 calls them a cloud of witnesses. I mean, all of those people spoken of in the Old Testament, all those people I just talked about, what they did for the faith, they are a cloud of witnesses for us. Now then, what does that mean that they're a cloud of witnesses for us? First of all, 
They are a witness for us. They're a witness for us, meaning that we can read back and read about their lives and, and, uh, and grow from and learn from them according to their, let them witness to us by their life and build our faith. That's one way. But it's uh, the terminology that's used here, guys, is, is usually an athletic term here. It's talking about the, a cloud of witnesses and, and uh, running a race is what he's talking about. Well, if you think about running a race, uh, just think of it like this, the old Greek and, and, uh, and Roman cathedrals, you know, the uh, uh, whatever you call them, daggum things, it's got all them seats, an arena, huge arena, coliseum. I think I got all the words right there to <laughs> just pick one. And, but all of the runners, the athletics runners, would be down in, on the field. And you would have this uh, a stand that uh, surround that field of witnesses, witnessing them running. So it does say and mention that uh, guys, maybe they're up in the stands and watching us and witnessing us. So they're a witness to us, but they're a witness for us as well. But... Now, Scripture does not say anything, uh, you know, one way or another. If we can see those that are in heaven, can they look down and see us? I mean, I don't, to be honest with you, I don't think they can. Because I think when you get to heaven, you're going to be so consumed with what you see and just the love of God and the presence of His glory that you ain't going to be worried about anything else. And besides that, if you uh, got loved ones down here, you're not worried about them because they're in God's hands. The very person you're in the presence of, you know that they that He's taking care of them. So you ain't worried about them anyway. But I think it's what it's saying here is just, we need to run the race as if, as if our race of faith, as if they're up in those stands watching us. Amen. Just act like they're watching you. Run that kind of a race. Uh, lead that kind of a life. The next point I want to make is that uh, we need to remove hindrances to our faith. Now the uh, let us it says let us throw off everything. Let's just I'm going to read the verses again right there, starting one. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a, a great crowd of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders. So when we throw, the, the idea is, now this is talking about these athletic runners. This, they're in a race. They're getting ready to be in a race. Guys, if you heard of people shaving their legs, shaving their hair off of their bodies and stuff, just to get a little bit, you know, they don't want to drag on them. If they're running, they don't want something yeah. dragging and pulling them down. I know people right now that does that. I ain't going to be a runner because I'm not going to, I got too much hair to shave and I'm not going to do that. But, uh, I just have to lose the race, I guess, or just run a little bit faster because I'm not going to shave nothing. But these, when they said they threw them off, here's what they did back then. They took off their clothes. They ran in the buff. They ran naked because they didn't want anything holding them back. So when it says to throw off, it means to throw off all this stuff that's going to keep you from running a fast race, running a good race. So, and these things we're talking about, it didn't, it said those things that hinder. Guys, it, it, it doesn't mean that you take off all your clothes and get naked and run. That's not what it's talking about. It's talking about saying that, you know, all, there's a lot of good things in our life. There's a lot of good things. The, the thing that you need to put off might be this, you're paying way, way too much attention to your career. Maybe that's the number one in your life. Maybe it's a relative. Maybe it's a, maybe it's a, a relationship down here on earth that gets our main focus. Maybe it's uh, just money. Maybe it's just name something. It, it, if you think about those things, they're all good, but if our preoccupation or, 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 or our, our focus is on those, then I think it begins to, uh, to, to be a sin and they get in our way. Get in our way. So it's talking about those things when first is saying, talking about those things that are not necessarily sin, but they get in our way. Amen. But let me ask you this. If you if the Bible is saying, because it says, I'm going to read that next part. If the Bible is saying, take off those things that hinder, it, it says the, next, the very next uh, part of the verse is, and, and the sin that so easily entangles. 
If, if we are to, to, uh, to throw off the things in our life that are not sin, how much more do you think we should get rid of and lay down and, and purge ourselves of the sin that's holding us? Because they don't just hold us back. Sin don't hold us back. It trips us up. It tangles us up. You know, I, I remember in, in Genesis chapter, I think it's chapter 3, verse 18, if I remember, I, I think I made that note uh, early this morning, and I'm going to go ahead and turn there and read this to you. But it's uh, when, after God cursed the ground, and it says, it will, be, it will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. God cursed the ground. Before we sinned, you know there were no thorns and thistles? You ever walked out in the woods? Have you ever tried running in the woods? It's almost impossible. What are you going to do? You're going to get tangled up on thorns and thistles. They're going to be sticking all over you. You might be, uh, be able to get through there, but you're going to be a bloody mess when you get out the other side. Because there's thorns and thistles in there. They get you tripped up. You're going to fall several times. That's what this is talking about, that the sin in our lives, that apparent sin that we need to deal with is going to tangle you up where you can't, uh, uh, you can't operate and, you can't, and you're not going to run the good race of faith. And did you know that each and every one of us have a different mark, uh, uh, race marked out before us? Now, we're all in the same race. But my race has markers that take me in a different direction. The, the, the markers are uh, 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 tribulations, things that happen. For me, it was a uh, man. It was cancer for me one time, and I, and I know uh, Barbara, you're you're suffering from that right now, and maybe some others here. But uh, maybe you know somebody that is. But that's sure enough something that'll uh, stop you dead in your tracks, <coughs> and mm -hmm. it's something you've got to get through. Though you've got to get through it. Amen. And with Christ's help, we can get through it. But uh, I've got to have myself. I've got to move back in here now. The next point I want to make is in the last part of the, the balance of that of verse 1, if you will. And that is run the race of faith. That sounds kind of crazy when you say it. But, uh, guys, you need to be in the race. What does it say right here? It says, uh, and let us run with, with perseverance. The race marked out before us. So each one of us has a different uh, race that's marked out. But you know what, guys? You've got to get in the race. You know, you can be a Christian and not be in the race. You can. So he's reminding us. The writer of the, the author of Hebrews here is reminding us that we need to get in the race. We need to remind ourselves that this is not a sprint. It's a marathon race. And that marathon, the finish line, is when we uh, enter through the pearly gates of heaven. That's our finish line. So we, don't, we need, we need to uh, continually have that in our mind that, that we're in this race constantly. Constantly. In fact, the word race, uh, you find it. The root word for the word race is the root word for agon. The word agon. It's where we get our word agony. Agony. That means that we are to agonize through these walls that come up before us. Did you know that a marathon runner, uh, I've never ran a marathon, so I don't know. But uh, I've heard people talk about it that, uh, you know, at that point when you just, I mean, you've been running and running and running and your lungs are on fire and it feels like your heart's going to beat out of your chest. You're ready to throw in the towel. You're ready to quit. And a lot of people do quit because they think, oh, I, I can't take any more. I can't take any more. But if you will persevere through that, if you'll push and keep going, then you'll break that wall. They call it the wall. You come up to a wall that you feel like you can't penetrate. But if you stay in, just keep going and, and keep going, then you'll break through that wall and you'll get what they call the second wind. And you'll feel like you can just run forever. That's what they say. Like I said, I've never done a marathon, so I really couldn't witness, uh, be a witness to that, but uh, maybe some of you have. 
But you get to a point where I mean, you just feel like you've got your wind back, you're breathing right, and, and you, you just feel like you could just go on forever. Go on forever. And that can be deceptive. Because they say you need to save a little bit for the end so you can really pour, pour it on at the end. But me, I can't, I can't even pour it in at the beginning. Let's listen. At the end. My, my marathon would be about the, that door over there. And then I'm, <laughs> I'm huffing and puffing so much that sure enough, you do need to call paramedics for me. I find it hard to put on my socks in the morning. Much less, much less run a marathon. But that's physical exercise, I thank God, but we're talking about, I mean, uh, that's physical exercise, we're talking about uh, spiritual exercise, and uh, I, I can run a pretty good race when, talks, when, when it comes to spiritual things, so I'm, I'm good there. But, uh, but it's known as the second way. See, the Christian, this, this race of faith is a, a constant advancement 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 when you come up to that wall and you persevere and you bust through it then you keep going because to quit to stop is to go backwards see it's not a sprint you need to get off of the sidelines get back in the race or get out of the stands and quit being a spectator and get back in the race amen right Last point I want to make is uh, in verses 2 and 3. And that's to, uh, we need to recover our focus of faith. This is, I'm going to read those and come back and preach on them. Amen. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the, the joy set for, uh, set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that, uh, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Jesus is to be our focus. See, we can, while we're running, it's all right to take a glance off over to those, those folks over there in the, in the Old Testament, all of those forerunners. Glance over there at them and maybe just glance over to some of the some of the uh, the heroes of faith that are right here with you, running the race with you. I mean, we've had some pretty pretty. Uh, I mean, uh, Billy Graham is one that comes to my mind right now here in America. Glance over at old Billy Graham, but you turn back around and you put your gaze on the Lord Jesus. See, because I mentioned before that I'm not sure and I don't believe that people can see us from heaven. But you can be sure that Jesus sees you. Amen? You know that. He sees your every move. He knows everything about you. So I take, I take it like this. That so that we don't lose heart is what it's saying. So that we don't lose heart. Remember what Christ did for us. Remember that. And remember this. Jesus is your greatest fan. He's up there and looking at you and watching. He's, he's cheering you on. Come on, Bob. You can do it. Come on, Bob. i got a cure for you right on the other side of this. Just keep going. Amen? Amen. Amen. We can look away, but we need to zero our focus in on Christ. Amen? The author and perfecter of our faith. Verse 3 says, Consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest we become weary and discouraged. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. That's all you've got to do. And all of this, these things on this earth will grow just dim. I mean, it's, they'll mean nothing to you compared to the glory that you've got before you. Amen? I'm going to wrap this thing up here, Robert, if you'll come up, please, sir. We need to remember, God, we're running the race of faith, and it requires laying aside certain things and keeping our focus on Jesus. In order to do that, 
then the Word of God must be prominent in our lives. I'm going to ask you, is this one simple question? Where's your faith? Where's your focus here this morning? Now, I know that uh, 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 this, because we're here, we want to hear from Jesus. That's what we're coming here for. Amen. Amen. You're not coming here to listen to the pastor preach or something like that or assault the, the English language, which I can do very easily. <laughs> but, but you're here to hear from Jesus. Amen. And uh, in this new year, guys, I can't think of a, a, a better time if you don't know Christ, if you have not accepted Christ into your into your spirit, I can't think of a better time than to a, a way to start out a new year than to ask Christ to come into your heart. Maybe you've been on the sidelines a little bit too long, and you need to get back in the race. There again, it's it's a good way to start the new year to recommit your life to Christ. Either way, if you come up on the wall, maybe you've got a wall that you brought in here this morning that you're having a problem, you're having trouble breaking through. Bring it up here to the altar and drop it off. Let Jesus handle it for you. Focus on Him and let Him be who He is, the God of your life. If you want to ask Christ in your heart, you can do it right where you're sitting. Just say a simple prayer like this and mean it from your heart. Just admit to Him, Lord, I'm a sinner. And right now, Lord, I turn from that sin. Lord, I, I believe that You're right and I'm wrong and I want to do things Your way. So Jesus, I'm asking You to come into my heart now. I receive You by faith into my spirit. I believe You died on that cross for my sin. And that you rose back to life. And you're living in me now. I recognize you as my God, my Lord, and my friend. And from this moment forward, I will serve only you. In Jesus' precious, precious name. Amen. And I say this every... I say that prayer every week. And I say this every word through that guy's the most important decision you make in your life. And if you did, accept Christ this morning uh, you felt the presence the, the emptiness you came in here with begin to be filled would you please come and see me right after I pray us out of here uh, I need to talk to you about that's the most important decision you can make in your life and I need to talk to you about it just pray out one last time we'll get on out of here Father God we love